welcome back. And I am so sorry for the delay, but I really appreciate your patience. And I particularly appreciate those of you who have reached out over the course of time. The social media messages, the emails, the phone call. Amazing. So really, thank you so much. The delay lasted longer than I expected, but I'm so excited to be back to the podcast. And this week, we're going to pick up where we left off at the end of the first English Civil War. You're listening to Rejects and Revolutionaries with Sarah Tinsolvola, a podcast tracing the origins of America from the Tudor era to the 20th century. First, though, since it has been a few months, I'll start with a quick summary of what's happened so far, so if you need a quick refresher, here it is. By the early 1640s, England had a handful of American colonies, best established on the North American continent, but also a handful of fledgling settlements around the Caribbean. It also had a deeply unpopular king, and a powerful Puritan opposition to said king, and in 1642, the two groups clashed in what is, for my money, the most interesting war in history. America's colonies had differing sympathies in that war. The Puritan colonies of New England were unified in their support of Parliament. Virginia's loyalty strongly skewed in favor of the king. Maryland was a mess, with its founders being Catholics, with royalist sympathies, but with a radical, belligerent, and growing Puritan minority, which favored Parliament. Bermuda's loyalties were split, but early on, the parliamentary independents had all the power and abused said power in pretty shocking ways. As for the Caribbean, Different islands had different political leanings, but by far the biggest colony was Barbados, which had managed to remain completely and totally neutral thanks to the leadership of its governor, Philip Bell. During the war, though, every colony was forced by necessity to maintain at least an officially neutral position. They couldn't afford the political fallout of backing the wrong side, and they certainly couldn't afford to be picky about which ships they traded with to sell their goods and buy the things they needed. Things like clothes and food and tools. Though it's not immediately relevant, I should also remind you that trading with the Dutch was far preferable to trading with any English ships. Because the Dutch could pay higher prices for every colonial product, and they could sell necessities for lower than any English merchant would. They just had a more advanced economy. So great was the difference that it was only trade with the Dutch that lifted the Chesapeake in particular out of the inescapable poverty which had characterized its early years. But tangent aside, during the war, even the most passionate colonist could only watch wait, and wonder how things would turn out while going about business as usual. Meanwhile, England was being torn apart. Death and devastation were everywhere. Violence escalated. Life was miserable. As Puritans started to win the war, they also found their own sides splitting into increasingly polarized factions. The more conservative Presbyterians, many of whom started to join the Royalist ranks, and the Independents, who were radical enough that their getting political power would have been unthinkable before the war started. But, because the Independents, led by Thomas Fairfax and Oliver Cromwell, had effectively won the war for Parliament, their credibility increased, and so did their popularity. By 1646, it was over, for a couple of years at least. The turning point was in 1644 at the Battle of Marston Moor, and then the remainder of the king's army was nearly wiped out at Naseby in June of 1645, and just a couple of months after that, the last royalist port, Bristol, fell, rendering all royalist ships fair game for parliamentary privateers. And then, Finally, in 1646, the king surrendered. 
I didn't actually discuss the surrender in the last episode, but basically Charles had spent the previous few months trying to weigh his options and see if he could salvage a victory. He ultimately decided that the best option was to head north from Oxford and meet with the Covenanter Scots at Newark, and it was to them that he ultimately surrendered. That's a very complicated, very significant story, but what you need to know for now is that the king surrendered, the war was over, and a by now deeply divided parliamentary side had emerged victorious. There were new taxes, like the justifiably unpopular excise tax on things like salt, meat, and beer. Royalist estates were sequestered, confiscated by Parliament, and sold back to them at a Parliament-decided price, and the policy of transportation had begun. Now, I won't get too much into the North American American colonies today. The long-term effects of parliamentary victory are complicated, and we'll get into them over the course of time, and the immediate reactions are largely predictable. New England rejoiced and started editing the king out of its history books, literally revising its official chronologies to remove the fact that the king had been the one that issued their beloved charter. And by 1649, they would actually erroneously be giving Parliament credit for this. Meanwhile, Virginia mourned, while waves of disaffected, destitute cavaliers sought a fresh start in a friendly colony. Maryland deserves its own episode. Recovering from the plundering time and Calvert's death, struggling with food shortages, subduing Kent Island rebels, and trying to solidify new colony leadership, And then you have Bermuda and Barbados, and that's what we'll discuss today, because this is where we're going to see the most dramatic changes as a direct result of the end of the war. First, Bermuda. Bermuda had been grappling with intensely divided loyalties during the war, and a company which was indecisive enough, quite probably thanks to its own divided loyalties, that it couldn't prevent one side from abusing the other. First, the independents were in control, and their behavior was radical enough and tyrannical enough to drive Presbyterians into alliance with the Anglican royalists, a foreshadowing of things to come in England. Then, the company had unsuccessfully tried to even out the balance of power by appointing a triumvirate instead of one governor, but this blurriness had just led to both sides being horrible to each other, so it was a mess. But when the war ended and independence entered England's national spotlight, there was a surge of royalist sentiment among anyone with even the slightest loyalty to the crown. It was in this atmosphere that the Bermuda Company sent Presbyterian Thomas Turner to quash the independence once and for all. Ish. And Turner went about his job with gusto. He forbade independence from holding meetings, preaching, or even taking part in government. He accused John White of treason. Independence became little more than political targets, sent to jail for minor offenses, and forced to hold their services in secret. Popular anti-independent sentiment had combined with the personal desire to retaliate and created a situation just as horrible as the independents had once created, just in reverse. This, as we'll see, would not be a permanent thing. In just a couple years, Bermuda would go back to the muddled and ambiguous division of power that it had experienced under the triumvirate. It wasn't actually the company's intention for people to retaliate in this way, and some of the actions occurred against their explicit instructions. The situation remained long enough, though, to cause one important development. Back in 1644, Bermudians had sent a couple of ships to a Caribbean island that they called Eleutheria, or Eleuthera, Eleuthera. 
One had sunk on the trip, killing everybody on board, and the other had returned with news that the island just wasn't an appealing colonization prospect. It didn't seem particularly profitable or hospitable, so they hadn't pursued the idea of settling it. By 1647, though, a couple of years had passed, and times had certainly changed. The island might not be that great overall, but the independents now decided that it was probably good enough, and it was the closest, easiest Caribbean island to reach from Bermuda. It might be a good place to found a new settlement, one based purely on the independent spirit as it existed in the 1640s. They described their vision as a land of pure liberty of conscience where every man might enjoy his own opinion on religion without control or question, complete and utter toleration. The true nature of what they sought was a little bit different than that all-too-tempting description. Liberty and toleration were the language of their movement, but not the reality of their movement. It wouldn't have included Catholics, and given their previous actions, it would be very surprising if theirs had even included Presbyterians, and certainly not High Church Anglicans. The point was, no bishops, no king, no hierarchy, no limit to their particular brand of radicalism. People like familists, later Quakers, Anabaptists, the intellectual descendants of Elizabethan Brownist. Economically just shy of the levelers, politically favoring a system that was as close to a popular democracy as practically feasible, It's most akin to what Roger Williams had created in Rhode Island, but in some ways even more extreme. It was a movement with support, though. Sale was close to the independence of the Bermuda Company, as well as independent former Bermudian colonists. He found support among future regicides and even members of the old Providence Island Company shareholders. So on July 9th, 1647, Sale and 25 shareholders signed the Articles and Orders of the Company of Eleutheran Adventurers with a constitution that reflected their shared ideals to the letter. Everyone would have access to land, natural resources, and a vote. No bishops, no kings, no real involvement from London which was actually possible for this company because the costs of moving from Bermuda were so much less than the costs of moving from England, and they could rely on surrounding colonies for support, so there was no real investment necessary. Eleuthera could be free and experimental because it was cheap. All land would be worked communally for the first three years which was an idea that had already been tried in both Plymouth and Jamestown. But afterward, land would be distributed proportionally to investment. There would be a unicameral legislature that held all political power, authorized to appoint justices, distribute public lands, manage public labor and finances, and pass laws. And the governor would only be head of this Senate. Document in hand, Commissioned governor, supplies gathered, and volunteers accompanying him, Sale returned to Bermuda just long enough to gather 70 of the island's Congregationalists to head to Eleuthera. They reached the island without too much trouble, and then looked for a place to settle. A handful of people got off at the first landing place, led by a young captain from England who refused to worship or accept any authority whatsoever, and most of the others made their way to settle on the north of the island. There, their ship wrecked among the reefs, destroying all their provisions, supplies, and livestock. 
They made their way to a small cave for their first refuge and place of worship, and that place, named Preacher's Cave, still exists today. And they spent the first few months of their new lives surviving on whatever wild fruits and animals they could forage. No tents, no houses, no tools to build them. Sale immediately went to Virginia to get supplies from that colony's independent sympathizers. And meanwhile, more reinforcements prepared to leave Bermuda. When both of these arrived, it was time to clear the land and plant corn, peas, and pumpkins. Interestingly, using Powhatan cultivation techniques, which had now become standard. Like all early settlements, though, they struggled with their first crops and only found viable growing practices through trial and error. Like all colonies, the settlement of Eleuthera continued to struggle, but it survived and it's officially joined our story. Though in the future, I'll be referring to it, at least sometimes, by its more recognizable name, the Bahamas. So that is the story of how the Bahamas were founded because of Oliver Cromwell. And now to Barbados. When last we left Barbados, it was unique among English colonies. It was, of course, now firmly rooted in sugar production, and already the wealthiest of all English colonies. It was also the first colony, apart from Providence Island, to intentionally import slaves, though at this point it only had about 800 out of a population of 18,000. But that was still triple the number of Africans who lived in Virginia at the time. Still, the colony mostly depended on indentured labor from England. Barbados was an island with deep political divisions stemming not only from its English roots, but from specific conflicts regarding its patent, which had led to immense devastation in the earliest years of the colony. And to counteract the greater than average risk that the war would spread in a violent way to Barbadian soil, the colony had united around the absolute necessity of remaining neutral not just with regard to merchant vessels and trade and official proclamations, but even to the point of personal interactions. This was an effective policy enabled by effective leadership, and despite push after push from England after Carlyle's defection to the parliamentary side, the island's residents united in upholding neutrality. The end of the war, though, would bring far greater threats to Barbadian neutrality than the years of war ever had, and these threats would come from both sides in very different ways. From the royalist side was simply the flood of exiles, and from the parliamentarian side, Carlisle was planning to go to Barbados personally to replace Bell as governor and to declare the colony's allegiance to Parliament. First, the Royalists. Like I said, the end of war pushed Royalists out of England en masse. They had lost everything, and England itself had lost its familiarity as the independents grew in power. Between that and the policy of transportation, for which Barbados was the most common destination, Barbados experienced a population boom even bigger than that of Virginia's, going from 18,000 to 30,000 colonists in just five years. There was a difference, too. And let's put aside transportation for just a minute. If you were a destitute royalist choosing where to build a new life, Virginia and Barbados had different selling points. Virginia was never renowned for its standard of living, but if you were a royalist exile, you could count on a friendly government and probably a few friendly faces in Virginia. Cavalier veterans were welcomed as heroes in Virginia, and William Berkeley had himself spent some time fighting in the war, 
yes, the disease issue was still there. And Virginia had never quite managed to strike it rich on tobacco. The average Virginian still lived in a way that would be comparable to the English poor, and the most successful Virginians didn't live much better. If you went to Virginia, you went for the culture and the connections, and likely because you already had family and friends there. You went for the people because the colony really couldn't offer much else. I've always said that the decision to go to Virginia was more of a reflection on someone's desperate circumstances than anything, but these were desperate times, and between 1640 and 1650, Virginia's population rose from 10,000 to about 19,000. Like you can imagine, though, this was able to happen without any appreciable change in culture, and if anything, it only strengthened already dominant cultural trends. On the other hand, Barbados was rich even by English standards. Sugar was valuable, and merchants happily supplied the island with the finest foods and wines from Europe. It was a hub of trade for New Englanders, the Dutch, and pretty much everyone else. If you went to Barbados, at least voluntarily, you went for the opportunity. Lots of people had lost everything in the war, and Barbados offered the best chance to rebuild that. Plenty of people didn't have all that much to begin with, and for them, Barbados was also an opportunity. It wasn't about the family or the community or the culture. This was an economic decision. And let's return to transportation whose victims were scattered around the American colonies, but who, more often than not, ended up in the Caribbean, especially Barbados. Everyone from loyal royalists to prisoners of war to Irish non-landowners to prostitutes to people who had committed misdemeanors and ended up in a jail that didn't want to bother housing them could end up being transported to Barbados as an indentured servant. One of Hugh Peters' pet projects was to send poor kids and orphans to the colonies, and plenty of children were actively tricked and stolen from their parents by people hoping to make some money, a practice called spiriting. Transportation and its offshoots were the great threat, and the great fear of the post-war world. Such a feared prospect that it actually made it harder to recruit indentured servants in legitimate ways. One Virginian who had gone to London to try to entice the city's poor to American shores found himself shunned when he so much as mentioned the colonies, because people feared that he was a spirit, So needless to say, the people who actually ended up being, quote, Barbados weren't exactly thrilled to be in the colonies either. So I just want you to imagine right now that you're a member of either of these groups. Now imagine that when you arrive in Barbados, a local tells you that We have this policy that you're not supposed to call your enemies by derogatory names, and that if you do, you have to throw a dinner party for everyone within earshot. Now, I say this as somebody who has the highest respect for the peace that Barbados had managed to maintain during the years of war. This was just a different world, and words like that would ring extremely hollow for anyone who had experienced the war firsthand. So it's not even a criticism of either group, but the practical effect of this is that Barbadians who had so diligently maintained peace and neutrality during the war were now overwhelmed by people who had lost so much so painfully that they had no aspiration toward neutrality. And at the same time, Carlisle was preparing to sail to Barbados to force the island to declare loyalty to Parliament. 
he would replace Bell as governor, and he was perfectly content to deal with any retaliation from the island's royalists. He even said this. It was past time that the colonists declared their loyalty to the parliament, and any conflict or fallout would just have to be dealt with directly. Now this is where Barbados got lucky. When Carlisle prepared to go to Barbados, lots of people in England stepped forward to stop him. The day he got his pass, two groups of people filed objections. The first was people to whom he owed money. Most of this was debt that his father had accumulated, but Carlisle had the money to pay them back and had chosen not to. So now they accused him of leaving to avoid paying his debts, and they emphasized that they actually did need their money back for their own well-being. The second objection was led by London merchants. London merchants, in general, were pretty aggressive with their attempts to profit off of colonial ventures, and mostly this was at the expense of the colonists. In this case, though, Barbadian and merchant interests aligned. If Carlisle really did go and cause all this fallout in Barbados, they would lose a lot of money. To prevent this, they went back to the colony's origins and claimed that Carlisle's ownership of the colony wasn't legitimate and that in fact, the colony should be led by the heirs of William Corteen, its legitimate owner. Courtine's allies, who had spent time in Barbados, also joined in the lawsuit, and while either petition would likely have been enough to keep Carlisle in England, the combination definitely was. The Committee for Plantations started to investigate the validity of Carlisle's patent, and Carlisle started looking for various ways to defend his claim. One thing he did and the most important thing for our story, was to lease his claim to a relatively prominent Presbyterian named Francis Willoughby. Willoughby had been the man to muster the train bands of Lincolnshire at the beginning of the war. Carlyle leased his Caribbean claim to Willoughby on extremely good terms, 21 years during which Willoughby would be entitled to half of all quit rents in Carlisle's Caribbean islands. Willoughby was about to become a very wealthy man. Carlisle was banking on a couple of things here. At this point in time, the king was trying to negotiate a deal with the Presbyterians against the independents, and Carlyle was hoping that a Presbyterian deal with the king would solidify Presbyterian leadership of the whole country, and that leasing the land to Willoughby would incentivize him to use his influence to back up Carlyle's claims. This wasn't a terrible plan, except for one thing. Presbyterian negotiations with the king fell through, and with that failure, their influence in England crumbled. The independents emerged as the dominant force in post-war England, and Willoughby's Presbyterians really didn't have much influence at all. Willoughby still had the lease, though, for another 21 years, and therefore he has officially entered our story. As for the lawsuit, Well, it fizzled too. Courtine had been dead for a decade at this point, and none of his kids were particularly interested in running Barbados. Between them, they were either fighting another lawsuit regarding some Dutch lands, or they had shifted their focus to trading in the East Indies, or they were among the destitute royalists whose estates had been sequestered. So even though Warwick's commission voted unanimously in their favor, no one stepped forward to claim the title. Parliament then decided to leave the title with Carlisle, 
but only after having ruled against its legitimacy, so they could step in and take over at any time. Another threat had been averted, but Barbados did have a new parliamentary leader. Or did it? When the Presbyterian cause collapsed and the independents started taking control of England, Willoughby actually joined the ranks of alarmed Presbyterians who defected to the Royalists. He met with the king, went to the Netherlands, and became vice-admiral of Prince Rupert's navy. Prince Charles, on order of the king, confirmed his lease and appointed Willoughby royal governor of Barbados. So actually, the victory of Parliament and Carlyle's aggressiveness on their behalf pushed Barbados firmly toward the royalist camp, both in terms of population and in terms of leadership. And that is where we'll leave it for today. Next week, it's back to the North American continent to look at what's going on in Maryland. And after that, we'll check in quickly with New England before getting to the Second English Civil War.